Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, welcome to the CMA and SEMA weekly webinar series. I am Jackie Lewis, VP of Content here at the CMA and SEMA. And today we have a fantastic expert panel lined up to discuss one of the most, if not the most timely topic in retail today, which is inflation, supply chain challenges, and the impact on consumer behavior. Our panel is going to be moderated by Susie's Chief Customer Officer, Katie Grass, with special guests Pearl Park of J&J &J and Emily Walgenbach of Nestle. And we are thrilled to have these experts here to discuss how Insights leaders are navigating consumer sentiment around product shortages, in-store versus online shopping for those hard-to-find items, as well as some predictions on summer shopping trends as well. So. Uh, feel free to enter questions at any point during the discussion in the chat box in the upper right hand corner of your screen. We're going to have time at the end with our panelists uh, to take your questions. And then finally, a copy of the recording will also be available to all CMA and SEMA members that registered for this webinar in our resource library on demand early next week. And we will make sure to get out an email uh, to everyone with that link as well. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Katie. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Insights 2022, how Johnson & Johnson and Nestle are unlocking shopper behavior. I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer of the real-time market research platform, Suzy. And we partner with hundreds of the world's top brands to help identify more agile ways to tap consumers for both quantitative and qualitative insights that drive business decisions. And I am excited to welcome you to today's discussion featuring Pearl Park from J&J &J and Emily Walgenbach from Nestle. So first, let's get to know each other a little bit better. Emily, would you introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. So hello, Emily Walgenbach. I am a senior manager um, for Shopper Insights, supporting the frozen foods divisions for Nestle USA. Um, so in terms of my background, um, many will not find it relevant, but I actually think it was a, a great place to start out my career and a great foundation. I started out my post-collegiate life as a high school math teacher, and I was the high school swim coach for a few years. Um, I spent then um, post-MBA about 10 years plus with Nielsen, now Nielsen IQ, working directly with both manufacturers and retailers to understand both their in-market performance and of course then how shoppers um, and consumers you know, impacted or those decisions they were making impacted uh, performance. So, and some of that time was with Nestle, but um, yeah, I hit across several others. So then I joined Nestle USA in 2020 as part of the Shopper Insights team. I'm actually in the middle of, of transitioning roles, but, but both are firmly in Shopper Insights. And so really at Nestle, um, Shopper Insights, our team is really about understanding the why throughout the entire purchase decision journey or like path to purchase. So all of the, all of those decisions that impact um, they're the actual final choice to, to purchase a product. Um, we work most closely with, and I work most closely with category management and commercial development teams, but, but we really work um, across many cross-functional areas very closely with marketing, innovation, finance, um, you name it. So I hand it to Pearl. That's awesome. Um, Pearl, did you also start as a math teacher by any chance? <laughs> no, no. Math was a decent area for me, but I didn't start with such a cool background as Emily. Um, Pearl Park, everyone. Um, hi, I know there's a lot of folks on here that I haven't seen, former colleagues, etc. So happy Friday. Um, it's sunny over here, just outside of Philadelphia. And so I've been at Johnson & Johnson for 23 years, all within the consumer sector um, in multiple roles, primarily in the sales function. So I've been in sales roles, category management, trade marketing, uh, shopper insights and shopper marketing. However, I've spent the bulk of my career in category management, uh, both customer facing and in more centralized roles like my current role, uh, where my team and I are really focused on three key areas. The first being data automation, um, the second around Omni Insights supporting the digital and brick and mortar shelf. And lastly, around advancing tools and capabilities and partnering with such great partners such as Suzy. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. So pleased to be um, on the virtual stage with you both today. So in terms of the, the discussion, we're going to start around uh, the topic of navigating inflation and su supply chain shortages. So. First question, how have you both been using market research and agile tools to help you stay on top of consumer sentiment around inflation and potential product supply chain shortages? And Emily, we'll start with you if that's okay. 
Sure, I think, you know, I'm sure as everyone understands, you know, this particular environment is changing so quickly. Um, I feel like, you know, every time, every every week or so, the information that we're taking in that we're wanting to make decisions on two weeks later becomes out of date. And so we're working with a new set of, of real world um, challenges. So, um, and that's, you know, it goes from obviously like the global supply chain challenges to inflation. And then I think everything sort of blew up again when Russia invaded Ukraine. So it's just this constant cycle. So we found that, um, agile research and tools are becoming increasingly important and that we're really wanting to understand what's happening now in order to impact decisions now and that we can't wait for in many cases research that's going to take you know eight weeks 12 weeks or, or some of these bigger studies 16 weeks to be able to return because at that point it is it's out of date you know so we're really looking for anything that, that can come in so that's where Susie is a great example of you know of a vendor partner you know to work with that we can get back kind of overnight those actions because we are actually going to take action on them immediately so yeah that's great and what about you Pearl yeah and I'm just so grateful and thankful that we have these tools where we can get insights on demand uh, particularly given how volatile the market is right now so um, you know, what I think is really important when it comes to understanding the impact of inflation and product supply um, is that we take a look at the different shopper demographics, because what we're seeing in the data is that there's definitely differences when it comes to income level, particularly when it comes to inflation, and also with some of the age cohorts. So if you have the ability to look at shopper behavior with tools such as Suzy, um, I recommend that you start targeting at the retailer level and then seeing how that shopper sentiment is different across the categories and versus the rest of the market. So tools such as Suzy are really helpful here. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Um, and so, I mean, just to dive a little deeper, I'm wondering, have you changed the way that you're talking to consumers during this inflationary period? And how has that research kind of helped you shape or make some adjustments? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that we're we're changing sort of the language in which we're speaking with them, but there are other ways that we are, um, you know, adapting how we're how we're using research and how we're looking at it. So um, I think we are, you know, increasingly, you know, more looking at trying to take in any type of insight that we can get from third parties, even now, to understand exactly what is what is happening in the moment, um, to be able to really understand you know, the the trade-offs that folks are making. And so one of the things I think we're finding is that especially this this time period is so different from historical periods. There's not a lot to draw on to understand. You know, we can high level some of the trade-offs that we think that consumers are gonna make, but you know, they're they're feeling the pinch across every single household expenditure. Um, so it's we are now, I think, kind of needing to expand how we think about those trade-offs. And in some cases, it means needing to increase the amount of qualitative research that we're doing because the historical trade-offs that we might include in a quant research study to ask what are these changes you're making um, may no longer be be relevant, or we're missing out on trade-offs that they're making. So that's where the qual piece I think comes in to be able to set up for a quant study. Um, you know, in a, in a better way for, for better, more actionable insights. Um, and then it's kind of, like I said before, and, and with the Susie is also having to, and wanting to increasingly pulse with our shoppers now, because as Pearl mentioned, especially with the lower income households, we are going to start to, they are going to start to feel the impact of inflation, inflation over the next six to eight months. Some of that has been masked thanks to, you know, COVID, you know, increased savings that folks had, um, you know, stimulus checks, increased um, support with SNAP. And a lot of that is, is going away um, and, and has slowly, so it's been able to mask it. And so I think the next six to eight months is gonna be really interesting as, as Pearl mentioned, to watch how some of these different um, shopper demographics groups, um, you know, make decisions. Yeah, it's interesting as the world opens up, that kind of commuter cost again starts to rise. Um, as you mentioned, those stimulus checks are, um, are through um, and so on. So you kind of mentioned mixing qual and quant. Is there any other advice that you would give to other Katarina Insights professionals um, around the types of studies or types of key questions or methodologies that they should be using or adapting to? Yeah, I mean, you know, the obviously the large, you know, I think studies around, you know, path to purchase, market structure, you know, I think those are those are still relevant and have a need and, and that they'll still be in a lot of ways relevant over the next couple of years. 
Um, I think I'm more increasingly thinking about what are the business questions that we're trying to answer? How quickly do we need answers to be able to action on it? Recognizing that the environment that we're in now could look very different in six months. And so I don't wanna kick off a research study now where I'm gonna get results back in 12, 14, 16 weeks that are quite honestly then irrelevant and we're, we're in a different time period. So I think that's where it's just really having to think through what's the, um, you know, what's the business question that we need answered right now? And I think sort of entering a world where, um, I think we've all probably in research and insights recognized budgets, you know, kind of shrink and expand. And um, but it's getting to that, like, you know, as one of my colleagues says, Gimo, you know, good enough, move on. Um, and so being a little bit more comfortable in living with that, that good enough to say, OK, we're 80 percent of the way there. And that's the that's as far as we're going to be able to get in the next two weeks to be able to get to alignment, to be able to make a decision. So I think that's kind of how probably in, in the short term, at least we're changing things up. Yeah, yeah, I would completely agree. No, oh, sorry, I was just saying it's a great phrase, chemo. <laughs> yeah, and no, 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 I would completely agree with Emily. Um, in addition, anything that's attached to predictive research beyond six months, I would encourage scenario planning, right? So really coming up with three likely scenarios, uh, high, medium, low, however you want to look at it, and the variables attached to those scenarios so you can be fluid in the process. Yeah. And so in your opinion, which products or categories do you think are more elastic in regard to pricing right now for consumers, Pro? Yeah. So as you would expect, um, we see more of our health brands, particularly in the over-the-counter medicine categories that, that have higher urgent need attached to them, become very inelastic. Um, what I also will say, though, is that we see brands in the beauty category become very inelastic. Um, this is largely driven by social media trends, a post on TikTok, um, and some brands that have high loyalty attached to them and big heritage. We, we tend to see them be very inelastic. Um, but what I'd say about elasticity modeling in general and product elasticity, it's that it's really important to look at elasticity as only part of the equation. Um, what we found, particularly in the last two years, when we've looked at elasticity is that it's so highly influenced by variables that are like unforeseen, such as major storms, a post, a comment made by a media or a, a healthcare professional. Um, so with all these variables, I just think when you're doing elasticity modeling or any pricing strategy that you only look at elasticity as part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. A lot. It's funny you say that. We literally just had this conversation yesterday talking about that, you know, decisions that are made at the shelf are, you know, the price is, it's not in a bubble of just price, that there are still these other factors, some of which we can control, some of which we can't, that impact um, those purchase decisions. Um, you know, so it's not just about that actual price point or, or price per ounce that, that um, you know, the shoppers are, are thinking they're trying to get to. Um, we find in food and beverage that um, it varies, you know, the um, which categories are more or less um, elastic. You know, we're finding that some of these categories that we would define as, you know, everyday indulgences are, are a little bit more vulnerable and are becoming more elastic um, because those are the ones where it's easier to make trade offs. There's more opportunities, you know, and there's sort of the, the extra, the plus, the nice to have versus categories that are more closely aligned with commodities. Um, tend to be a little bit more sometimes inelastic in that these are things that like the household can't live without. So at least at a category level, obviously within the category, you know, brand by brand, you know, elasticities can also vary depending on what are those, um, you know, differentiated qualities and attributes that you bring to the category to make it worth, you know, potentially spending up or, or trading into, into your specific brand. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and so Pearl, kind of relying on a lot of your category management um, experience here um, for this portion, what are you seeing in terms of online versus in-store? And obviously you just referenced TikTok. I will say TikTok made me purchase a lot of hair products for today's <laughs> session. We could do an entire topic on TikTok related purchases, I think. Um, but what are you seeing in terms of online versus in-store shopping spaces during this time? And how have you been using research to better understand those online shoppers? Uh, sure. So I think um, a general statement across all categories, even outside of health and beauty care, um, is that growth in online trips and spends per trip 
are beginning to level off a little bit as shoppers are getting more comfortable returning to the store and getting back to some of those pre-pandemic routines. However, the bigger story is that the growth we've seen in the last two years with new shoppers coming online uh, will continue to grow, especially as new fulfillment methods are out there, last mile delivery options. So the growth is exponential. We have a whole department dedicated solely to e-commerce and online research. Um, but what I really love, uh, particularly when it comes to Suzy, is that I'm also able to understand the online shopper and that online shopper at a particular retailer. So we've used Suzy in so many ways to better understand um, our retailers online shopper, including things such as their experience, uh, what are the search terms they're looking at, how they like to consume their digital media. Um, we've asked questions around what social media platforms influence their purchases, uh, claims language, and so many different things that you can get through the tool custom to that customer and retailer. Um, in addition to that, uh, a really big ask that we're getting from our customers is the reasons why they are converting and not converting online. So to have the ability to do that um, at the retailer level has been really helpful. Yeah, that's great. Um, and actually a question that came from the audience that kind of relates a little bit to this, but are you seeing a difference between um, consumers purchasing brands versus store brands and private label? Not sure if you can answer that. Apologies, it came just came from the audience. So. No, that, that, that's completely fine. I think that's really dependent on the shopper, right? So that value equation is really unique to the shopper. And what I'd say is um, really influencing that right now is is what we're all experiencing with product supply, right? So depending on the urgent need nature of a given product, that's going to heavily influence that decision, um, as well as like a lot of the brand loyalty metrics that exist out there today. Yeah. That's great. Um, and another question just came from the audience, kind of related to to the topic. Also, um, in an inflation situation, isn't price per ounce the dominant factor, um, regardless of other variables, or are you seeing a difference there? I think it's going to again just largely depend on the category that you're looking at. So it, it's the way the shopper is really looking at the category and how they kind of create that value equation for themselves. So is it a price per pill? Is it a price per ounce that they're looking at versus a promotion that's driving what what's going to incentivize that purchase? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and so, are you seeing more people shopping online for their must-have items? Um, I think this is really largely dependent on what you define as must have. And I would argue that that varies even within our own family. I think my my 13 year old would argue that lip pumping gloss is a must have in our house. But um, what I think when you're looking at um, online purchases, uh, and what's considered must have, what we've tended to look at is what is actually driving that trip online. So it really is a good indicator of how you can shape your strategies and tactics. So uh, for example, if a trip is a little bit more urgent need in nature, time and convenience are gonna be a currency for that shopper. So a strategy, instead of focusing on content, could be focused more around fulfillment and last mile delivery. So again i think it's it's important to really take a look at, at what's driving the trip online yeah great and then thinking of in-store how important is shelf placement in store right now i i think shelf placement is always critically important and it doesn't matter if it's pertaining to the traditional brick and mortar shelf or even online so when you look historically at category sales across any category in store, there is a reason why the saying eye level is buy level came into existence. And when thinking online, the same things apply. Placement within the top five or within that hot zone are going to tremendously impact your sales. So as price change, brands change, new trends happen, a shopper really doesn't change how they like organically shop and react to a shelf so my recommendation is if you're trying to influence anything on shelf and shelf placement you look beyond like the traditional velocity heat mapping 
and think of ways that you can quantify the moves within a given uh, planogram. So my team and I at J&J, we've actually created some tools to help us quantify product moves within a planogram. And then I would recommend if you're working with different vendors or if you're trying to vet out different vendors to truly understand um, how they're looking at their historical analysis but also really taking out those other variables such as promotion, price, seasonality to come up with their modeling. Yeah, that's great. Can I just add too, I think, you know, the shelf placement is important. You know, a lot of times we'll take to even the, the bigger view to understand, you know, where's the best place in the store for our product and for our category to be located. You know, increasingly we are seeing category blending. And so it's not clear for a lot of products exactly where they belong. And we play in a lot of categories where you can ask, you know, person A and they'll say, oh, it should be, you know, in this location, you ask person B and they'll say a totally different. And so we're, we're also trying to understand, you know, where is the best place in the store from a, just a broader merchandising standpoint so that people are walking up to the right aisle because we do know that in certain categories, the walk rates are higher if they walk in and they can't, they don't even know which section to go to to find the category and to find the products that they're looking for. Yeah, Emily, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Sorry, I, we, we've actually done exactly that type of survey work within Suzy to understand the preferred placement. And, and like you said, Emily, if, if they have high walk rates, it's a big insight there. If, you know, uh, particularly if they're looking for a product in a certain area and it's not there, they might leave the store. So yeah, I definitely Especially, agree. Yeah, for categories that aren't your must have and things where, yeah. you know, it's it's not a, a milk or an eggs and a cereal where you're like, I have to have this now, but you're will you can wait, you know, and you don't need it or you can survive without it. So. Yeah. I will tell you a fun story from the weekend. I was trying to find tahini to make a particular salad dressing recipe I saw and had no idea even where to begin to look for tahini in a store. <laughs> um, so I did have to laugh quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> on this final kind of area of, uh, of inflation and as a child of the 80s and 90s myself and having seen inflation before, just my own curiosity's sake, how long do you think this current inflation period will last? Or is that even something you can predict, <laughs> Emily? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would say that if I had a crystal ball right now, you know, I would be so rich. It would be amazing. Um, I, I mean, that's, the, I think, like the million dollar question, you know, um, even if we think about not even just inflation, where we started off with COVID and how long this was going to, to last. I think I was one of those very, very naive people that despite what I read and was hearing, you know, I was like, oh, two weeks, we'll shut down and like everything will be back to normal. And here we are two years later and we're we're still not kind of back to where to where it was. So, so many of these predictions we started hearing, you know, last year too, or actually even earlier, you know, about all the supply challenges. And then it was, you know, how that was impacting inflation, you know, broadly. And I feel like I remember hearing an article that was like, oh, we'll be over this by like Q1 2022. And obviously we're not, you know, and it's 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 moving forward and the dynamics keep changing. I mentioned Ukraine before, but I think that's another place where then it's exacerbated, you know, inflation and the supply challenges. Um, so it's, I would say I'm, you know, I'm really not in the business right now of, of being a gambler and making bets on on when where it will go. But um, but I think we are still you know trying to work through like you know what are some of those different scenarios. And I know Pearl will expand on that. But is thinking through you know being being ready for kind of a good, better, best of, of how things might unfold. Yeah, I completely agree. And my hope is not that long. But um, again, as previously mentioned, I, I think it's important to, to do scenario planning. In addition to that, like, again, with access to all these insights on demand tools, it, it's constantly changing. So being able to get that pulse at every moment in time is going to be really important. Yeah, great. So shifting slightly into kind of the topic of foresight and, and trend identification, normally around this time, you know, we'd be asking companies and, and I'm sure senior leadership are asking you to, you know, start looking at consumers um, and their attitudes and, and behaviors for summer 2022. But with so much uncertainty, you know, Emily, I have to ask, should we even be thinking about summer 2022 right now? I, would, I mean, 100 percent, you know, I just just because it's it's difficult and we really don't know where it's going to be doesn't mean that we can't get, you know, we may not get to perfect and we may not get to 90 or 80 percent. Right. But like, the, you know, as close as we can get to it is still better than just kind of throwing up our hands and saying, you know, we're going to walk away and let things, you know, be how it is just 
because there are certain things that, that we can control, you know, from a from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, so I do, and, and that's where the, these different planning scenarios are extremely important so that we can plan for, you know, a, a good, better, best, you know, a best, best case scenario, worst case scenario. So I still think it is, it is important, um, but I think it's aligning ourselves on What's the insight that we can get for right now and how close in we can get versus what we think it might be in nine months? So I think we're feeling a lot more comfortable about how things will play out over the next three months. Um, but then it's it's the further out that you go um, is where it becomes a little bit shakier. But so then we're I think it's sort of, you know, every month, if not faster, we are reevaluating what's all of the new information that we have and how do we update, you know, our um, our scenario planning and hope that you know sooner rather than later we'll get to a place where it was it's you know we're feeling more comfortable and confident but yeah. it's I said it before it's like be, becoming okay with a little bit too of living within the good enough territory at least in the short term yeah so that's a question from the audience that is they all love the idea of good enough move on Gimo is the new name of the game but <laughs> You sell that idea into the folks that don't work in inside spaces that probably previously relied on you to be spot on accurate and perfect and how do you sell them in on the kind of good enough move oh, on idea <laughs> yeah no i mean one of my friends my nickname is making waves so um you know it constantly yeah it's i think it's understanding within your organization though where can you use good enough move on versus where does it need to be more precise because 100 percent like that that isn't going to work for all decision making that is made. But I do think that for a lot of consumer shopper insight pieces, um, that is still, you know, we can still get to a place where we're comfortable enough with what we have to move on. And so I'm certainly not saying that it, the entire organization finance will not be on board with, with, <laughs> with my thoughts, you know, in a lot of ways, but um, but it's it's about where and and when to to influence and, and to try to try to push back to say, you know, okay we can spend another 12 weeks and X amount of dollars to get to 98%, I mean, we're never going to get to 100%, but to get to 98% of the way there. But at that point, like I said, the information may be you know, useless or irrelevant because we will have had to make a decision. We will have had to kind of you know, move on. Um, I mean, I will say I've found that in um, with divisions, categories, you know, brands that are more resource constrained, they are a lot more comfortable living in the GEMO world. You know, it's the really big, huge brands that are used to kind of getting all the way there that it's that it's harder and it's, it's a little bit more uncomfortable. But um, I think, you know, bringing kind of the examples and, and the expertise and, and, you know, pushing forward, it's slow, it's slow movement, but you can get there. Yeah, thank you. That makes sense. Um, and so, Emily, I, like you, thought this is just two weeks. And in fact, I had a salad in the fridge at work that I'd left in the fridge. <laughs> and, uh, lo and behold, six months later, when I went to get that out, it was not looking good. Um, this project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that new normal definitely has had us kind of going in and out of isolation um, over the last two years. And now, of course, we're hearing news of another potential COVID wave and other variants coming out of um, other countries. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how are you asking your consumers some of these kind of future thinking questions? And Emily, we'll go back to you again. Sure. Yeah. So we have stopped asking like the new normal, you know, and, and when will it be? I think we're we have gotten to a place, you know, at Nestle that that this is the new normal, at least for the foreseeable future, you know, and um, and state local governments have also kind of talked more about how we are moving into um, COVID as an epidemic and that we may be you know, there may be down the line um, instances where masks are mandated again and that there may be, you know, some lockdowns of some form, um, but that this really is kind of the, the new normal. And so um, it's, I think there's, so we're not really asking a lot of those maybe futuristic questions in the same sense. And it's focusing on, you know, how are they, the, how are they coping with things like right now? You know, or it's asking about the future might only be in over the next three to six months. And so we're not pushing out. You know, I feel like early days of COVID, it was like when the pandemic is done, what will you do? You know, um, but we're also seeing too, what's been hard about it is all of those things that people thought they were going to go back to pre-pandemic hasn't played out. I mean, we are in a new world, you know, work from home um, is, you know, Nestle is a great example where we were, you know, pretty much in the office most days of the week. 
And, and now we've moved to a, a more agile environment, giving people kind of more the opportunity to, to work, to do the right work at the right place. And so if you've got days where you're on the phone the entire time, no point in being in the office, do that at home. You know, I mean, obviously we still have an office and we still have the office environment, but, um, but there isn't that expectation that you're in the office five days a week. And, you know, that is where we are not alone in that. Um, so, so I think it's, it is kind of, will be interesting to, to evolve and watch to see how this like new normal plays, plays out. Yeah. I like your phrase, um, the right work at the right place makes a lot of sense. Um, and, uh, I, I did see an article on LinkedIn recently that had stated any time a company states, we're all going back to the office, everybody must come back, that recruiters really pick on that and start targeting people from those companies. Um, because you're right, it's, I don't think we'll ever go back to a five days a week in the office, um, yeah. really ever again. And I think we've all proven we're often much more efficient working from home as well. Mm. Um, to end this kind of section on a positive note, anecdotally, is there anything that you or the consumers have been talking about that they're particularly excited about for this up and coming summer? I'll just do a shameless plug. Coffee Mate Drumstick <laughs> is already on the shelves in Walmart, but it is coming to a local retailer near you come this summertime. So, you know, just in time for all of the heat. Emily, I'm requesting some samples. I'm just, you know, shamelessly asking for that as well, as they're very popular in our household. So, yeah. So, uh, it, it, you know, I think everyone is looking forward to summer. Just given just even some of the changes that come into your routines, uh, outdoor, outdoor eating, gatherings, etc. So, um, just definitely, personally, very much looking forward to it. So, yeah. I'm European and so I love all of the outside seating <laughs> reminds me of kind of Paris and Spain and uh, definitely not necessarily England because it rains all the time. <laughs> um, so switching gears to talking about agile tools and you know, consumer insights processes um, of today and so on. So how have you leveraged new agile insights tools like Suzy? to stay on top of consumer sentiments um, and a two-parter because there was also a question from the audience that asks um, a really relevant question which is how do you know that these tools are actually delivering accurate information yeah so, so i'll start with that one so particularly um we've used suzy for so much on consumer sentiment around uh, post-COVID behavior, inflation, et cetera. Uh, but we've also used the tool, uh, as we mentioned, for even placement, right? That's a big way to use a tool, understand consumer preferences. Uh, we've asked about clo closure claims and language. So that's a big way we've leveraged Suzy. Um, and you can get down to a retailer's shopper base right, to really understand what claims resonate with them. Um, and a big one that's come from a lot of our retailers is really trying to get to why their shoppers are converting in store and not converting and the reasons why. Um, I think Emily touched on that. Getting to the why is really important uh, and really great insight that we could bring to our customers. Um, and then lastly, we've used it even from an assortment perspective. So outside of the quantitative stuff, you can get through different tools. Uh, we've asked them about assortments in stores and, and what they will do if product isn't available at their given retailer. So um, it's a great way to leverage the tool. Um, so, um, and Katie, if you don't remind me asking what the panel asked about, yeah, absolutely. And um, it was asking about the accuracy of these types of agile tools. And there's actually a second kind of parter that was talking about um, the last question about how you assess tools and agile tools as, as you're bringing them into your tech stack. Yeah, so the, the typical difference that you're going to find with some of the agile tools that exist out there is how they get to their panel, right? So some panels are consumer opt-in, right, which, which is going to have um, a different set of results and some are validated purchasers, right? So that's that's a way where we kind of determine what the right tool to use is for a particular uh, business result you're looking for. So if you do are more comfortable with validated purchases, you know, you use different tools accordingly. If you're trying to get to that GEMO, I love that term, <laughs> right? <laughs> like some of these more, you know, consumer opt-in tools will be better suited for that. And it's also with the timing of the delivery, right? So some of these insights on demand tools have a little bit more lead time, right? So that's another way we determine which tools we're gonna use. 
You know what, too, what's nice about Suzy is that you can um, you can set up to, you know, any work that you're doing to say, OK, well, we know based on other validated information, we know that my consumers are 50 male, 50 female. And so I want to target and ensure that that's what my response rate is versus, you know, a category that might be more heavily dependent on males or, or females. And so there are those pieces, too, within Suzy that you can that you can um, that you can play with to to ensure that the coverage that you're getting is aligned with the coverage that you're looking for. Yeah, and thank you for the shameless Susie plugs. <laughs> also, <laughs> I think I will say that uh, what I hear often from clients when it comes to tools and, and accuracy in particular, that hybrid of qual and quant means that you are able to quantify your qual and then um, uh, and then kind of really dive deeper on the qualitative area too to see if this really is a trend um, that's uh, that's that's accurate. So kind of bringing those two together, I think, is also going to help kind of shape out accuracy in research. Mm -hmm. um, and on the topic of agile tools, you know, obviously it brings a lot of democracy into market research. So we'd love to hear um, more about how you're democratizing research findings across your organization. And we'll start with you, Emily. Sure. Um, I'll be the first to admit, you know, we're not perfect. There are opportunities for improvement, but um, having sort of worked in previous roles with, with Nestle too over, over a long period of time, I mean, there's huge gains that we've made. Um, and a lot of it's just the technology has improved to be able to help for that. So we we leverage multiple tools and, and multiple share sites to um, to house the information. And so ensuring that everyone kind of knows where everything is sitting. Obviously, it's still kind of in multiple places. So it requires that we are kind of constantly reminding people about about where things are, how to locate, how to access. Um, but I think that's that would be kind of true no matter no matter what. Um, but yeah, it's huge. I mean, we've changed some of the the platforms and the way that we're we're looking at data to ensure that we have that that many more people have access to. So it's not even access to the information, but it's access to the information in real time or in faster time, so that they're not having to wait for, say, me or someone else within Insights or you know or another vendor to be able to share out that information. But they can go in and say, hey, I need to know X, Y, or Z, and boom, it's right at my fingertips and fingertips immediately. That's great. We've come a long way from, uh, I remember 15 years ago, walking to, into a lot of uh, CPG and food and beverage companies, and they had the library room where you would have to go in and take up those research reports. Just had a quick flashback there. Um, mm -hmm. Pearl, what about your organization? How are you helping to democratize research findings? Yeah, I thank God for technology and all the shared sites and, and quicker ways to, to share information. So we have a lot of the same as Emily mentioned. Um, something really fun that one of my colleagues did um, she actually started a book club, so a shopper book book club amongst a group where we can come together and she takes everyone from every different team capacity and we come together to talk about different research. And so I thought that was a really awesome way to share some of the insights. Um, in addition, we do like monthly workshops, office hours and to really help people not only just understand the tools, but how to use them and, and getting to that why. Um, so that's been really helpful in kind of sharing some of the insights across the organization. I love that a book club. I know. Yeah, me too. Yeah. But I do. I love that point, Pearl, about sort of educating because, you know, there's so much information out there that more information oftentimes is just more information. It's not necessarily, um, you know, better, more impactful. And so really kind of understanding you know that that why kind of behind and how to be able to action on it becomes important with those trainings and, and those gatherings you know so that we're we're using it to the best of our abilities and that we're not also inundating folks with information just for the sake of information you know for information so i think at least within the consumer insights organization i do feel like we are constantly trying to sort of curate to that information so we're going through even you know more levels of information to say okay even in a we love our vendors and they deliver 100 page decks, but I know that like our folks, <laughs> the end users aren't going to be able to go through 100 slides. So like, let's bring that down and say like, you know, what are the what are the main pieces, 10 slides that they can actually go and take straight into like, and I'm constantly just like Pearl is saying, what can we like lift and shift straight into like retailer presentations to be able to, to, to update for that retailer and to be able to take out. So it's kind of another piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And as insights leaders, how are you empowering, you know, end users and really everybody at the company to be more directly responsible for getting to know the consumer? Democratization of data is key. 
also constantly reminding folks that like, hey, remember, you've got this, like, you know where, where, where it is. Um, but I do think the democratization is, is, is key. And you find for, for a lot of folks, they'd rather be able to like have those resources at their tips and go in to get the information on their own rather than having, you know, we as consumer insights, shopper insights folks at Nestle, like I don't want to be a gatekeeper. I don't want to be the one that's in the way of, of helping them understand who their shopper is and to be able to make decisions, you know, better decisions more quickly. So um, all like all of these tools, you know, and, and share sites and stuff that I've mentioned is, is really too, to get us to that place where folks are are empowered and feel like they really they know their consumer as well as the consumer knows the consumer. Yeah. And I think it's also important to get your colleagues out in retail and store, right, and, and have some good dialogue there. So you know, um, recently one of my colleagues just did a retail day, and it's it's so crazy to to see how other functions and things you'll find in stores like not just creating that packaging, but see how it plays out in retail, I think is so critically important. So to constantly mm -hmm. have time that's dedicated solely for that, I think is critically important. Yeah, we place, yeah, we, we do a lot of store walks too at, at Nestle and, and, and ensuring that they are cross-functional and so that marketing is getting out there. And, you know, I feel like as someone in Shopper Insights and you know, I'm sure like everyone else, I, I support categories that I am not a core consumer of, but I am constantly probably once a month and actually historically it was once a month. Now I feel like with my weekly shopping trip, I am walking down all of the aisles that I support constantly, you know, just sort of getting a look of seeing, you know, what's what does the shelf look like? You know, what are the, what's the overall shopping experience? So I kind of find that my shopping experiences the last uh, last month or so have been longer. <laughs> because I'm spending a lot more time and then making sure like we talk about this too, encouraging everyone to go out and we do it formally as a company, but then to go out and do it informally on your own. Yeah, my work related mom time where I'm like, oh, I need to go to retail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then and I find like reminding ourselves that we are also like shoppers, you know, so if how, what are thinking about how am I feeling going through the shopping experience and, and be able to have then kind of that empathy for, for our shoppers at the end, you know, I hate to like call out, but saltines, I was at, the, I was at a, at a retail store, you know, and I walked on, and I really wanted some saltines and there were literally none, no branded, no private label. There was nothing and going, and I remember I had this moment, I literally walked around the entire store because like, there's no way they can be out. I was just so distraught. And then having to go through like that list of trademarks or trade trademarks trade offs that I was that I was willing to make. I can't remember where I landed on it, but I know for a fact that I was not as happy when I walked out. And um, it was probably a few days later I went on the hunt for more saltines. So yeah, that's actually a question that came in from the audience, which is what will the consumer do if the product isn't available? And yeah, it sounds like walking out unhappy is potentially the uh, the challenge. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to, I think, kind of understand. And obviously, some of the trade offs by category are going to be going to be different. You know, um, is it? Are there? Um, you know, are there other brands? You know, on the shelf, I should say, within you, the brand that you were looking for. You know, are there other flavors that maybe you're willing to trade off to? Are there other brands that you're going to to trade over or trade down to? You know, maybe it's moving to private label. What are um, adjacent categories that you know, can fulfill the same need. You know, we all, at least in the food and beverage, there's always a trade-off. I mean, and I mentioned saltines, but snacks is a great example of a category where the the trade-offs are are huge. Um, so it's really kind of yeah, understanding what those are and and how important kind of that the price, the promotion being on the shelf is to those trade-offs. I mean, we learned with COVID, you know, those early days that there were so many out of stocks um, that people were forced to try other products. And, and ended up actually being very happy with the products that they got and very excited and saying, oh, I'm gonna incorporate and move this in, which means I think it's it's also a little bit of a concern. We are now in an environment where we knew going into this that millennials and Gen Z were less brand loyal than boomers and, and the Gen X you know, folks. But with COVID, people all became a little bit more 
you know, a little bit less brand loyal, a little bit more willing and okay with, with having to shift to other, to other products. So it's, it does, it makes it for a, a more challenging environment to predict how, how exactly shoppers will, you know, I think historically we've had like the percentages, X percent will stay within our brand and move somewhere else. X percent will move, you know, to another brand, X percent will hear, X, you know, and I think that's where like those shifts in, in especially in percentages and stuff, I think they're fine, you know, are, are changing. Yeah. yeah, and you just quickly add there is uh, that's why it's great to have tools where that that can help you kind of understand that. So we've actually, and it's not just a plug for Susie, we've actually asked that exact question, right, to our shopper base to say, hey, if this product's not available, what's your most likely action? Are you likely to purchase another product? Are you likely to leave the store? Um, or are you likely just not to purchase anything at all? So it's great to definitely have some data to support what what the shopper might do um, in addition to the traditional assortment tools that exist out there today. So, yeah, that was, you just answered a great question that came in from the audience right there, which is, do you map oh. these things <laughs> off by consumers during that part of purchase? And do those maps have overlays between categories um, and so on? Um, I actually think I read an SMR report that said that 51% of consumers are now more open to trying new products um, today than they were pre pandemic and I discovered Dr. Pepper cream soda because of supply shortages and it's delicious. So I was very happy to, to try some new products myself as well. Um, so moving on to kind of some of the final questions around, around the future. So where do you see category management and shopper insights headed in the next three to five years? And Pearl, we'll start with you. Yeah, I really don't think I'm biased in saying that category management and shopper insights is going to be more important than ever. Um, where I do see it evolving is with data science and predictive capabilities. Um, so I think it's important to understand how automation and machine learning are going to change how we do our work day to day, um, which I think is actually really exciting. Um, so, but, but I do, and I want to make this comment because I think it's really important is that I think however many coding tools, predictive modeling capabilities, advancements and data capabilities that you're always going to need translators. So it's one thing to get to the data really fast and a completely different skill set to, to garner the insights and deliver them in a compelling story. So I do feel like translators are going to be an incredibly important asset to, to any company right now. Yeah. Emily, what about yourself? Yeah, I think I think you hit on exactly what I was saying earlier, Pearl, like more data is just more data if you don't, you know, have sort of the right folks and the right team kind of being able to synthesize it. Um, yeah, I think I'll add, um, and it's funny since Pearl is sort of our omni, you know, category management expert is, I actually think, especially within our, our food and beverage world, where it's been a little bit further behind than some like the household goods within Omni is that um, I think we're really going to see over the next three to five years an actual Omni. I think we've been talked a lot about Omni, but it's really been more brick and mortar versus um, e-com. And I think that they're, we're going to really start to see them to come together more. Um, you know, during the pandemic, Whole Foods had some stores that they shut down that they were using strictly for fulfillment, you know, purposes. Walmart's just announced that they are changing around the landscape of and the footprint of their stores over the next several years to be able to better meet the meet the fulfillment needs of your brick and mortar, your um, click and collect and, and your delivery folks, because we're, we've also, we have learned over time that, you know, the assortment needs vary, whether you're a brick and mortar shopper, you know, versus an e-com shopper. So I think that will be really interesting and we're going to need to increasingly adapt and it, you know, and online shopping continues to increase. Brick and mortar isn't, you know, isn't this like going away. It's not going to be gone overnight. And the shoppers are are weaving in and out. And and so how does that how does that impact, um, you know, how we how we think about category management, how we think about shoppers, and really truly being omni. Um, I think that's going to be I think fun. I think it'll be really fun, especially as as retailers start to adapt to that. Yeah, and actually two great questions came in from the audience on this topic. Um, so how much technology integration do you think shoppers are looking for in store is part one. And part two is how are you getting that Omni Shopper Insights into the sales teams so they can leverage it with their retail partners? Um, sorry, can you say the first question again? Yeah, uh, um, how much technology integration do you think oh. the shoppers are looking for in store? A lot. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I think, um, you know, 
we have been there for a long time in non-food and beverage categories, I especially think like with clothing has been a great example. And so I think increasingly, yeah, especially for younger shoppers, they are looking for um, that integration. I think that is going to be challenging is that, you know, pricing oftentimes to be able to, to be competitive and do it right on e-com has been different than what you see in the store. But I think that is something that shoppers are are looking for and, and wanting will become increasingly important. Um, and then I apologize, I've already forgotten the second question. That's okay. this is, it's it was a Friday a afternoon now. <laughs> and there's like so many great, thank you so much to the audience. There's a lot of great questions coming in, so I'm trying to keep up. Um, how are you getting the Omni Shopper insights into the hands of the sales team so they can leverage it with their retail partners? I mean, in the same way that, that we're doing with our brick and mortar, you know, um, brick and mortar shopping. And what's what's great is that increasingly um, buyers are asking for this information, which means our, you know, um, our account managers and our field category management teams are also asking. So it actually hasn't, at least at Nestle, it hasn't been a problem. You know, we, we can't deliver the insights fast enough, quite honestly. So yeah, it's, and I, it's a huge runway there, which is exciting. Yeah, and I also say we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have departments dedicated to keeping not just um, the e-com team versed, but but all of our sales partners versed in trainings, understanding how the language is different, right? Understanding how we need to look at the digital shelf differently. So, and the metrics that really matter. So, you know, I'm really fortunate to have a peer set that's dedicated solely to that and really working hard with our sales analysts, uh, our sales folks to help them be versed in it, but also how to take that data and provide that insight to, to our retailers. Great. And Pearl, where do you see the biggest opportunity for category managers and, um, and shopper insights professionals to really sustain growth in your categories? Yeah, I, I think re it's really important just to stick to the fundamentals. So when you think about category growth, drivers within a given category, it's focusing on the insights uh, around what drives category growth. Is it expandable consumption? Is it new users? Is it new usage occasions? Are you trading up consumers? And so if you stick to that storyline and understand how your brands fit into that story, I think it's gonna be critically important um, to, to make sure that there is something behind your brands bringing that expandable consumption story to your retailers, right? So um, I think the best way is, is really just, again, to stick to the fundamentals of, of what category growth drivers are. Yeah, great. Um, and so obviously the audience today is full of category management and shopper insights professionals. So any final advice you have for them for the up and coming year, Emily? Um, I guess if I haven't hit on it, being agile is probably the the number one, and, and being being open to more agile methodologies. Um, but yeah, just and probably being okay with with GIMO, you know, is that knowing that it's a you know, and having that empathy is that the environment is just it's changing week to week, month to month. Um, so recognizing that uh, what you did a month or two ago unfortunately might no longer be be relevant and so being being agile and just giving your permit yourself permission to say like well that was true then but now we've got a new world so um yeah yeah and pearl yeah just to add there quickly and given the volatility of so many things that are impacting the data we look at and our day-to-day -day work, again, just stick to the fundamentals. And also my team and I, very similar to GEMA, which I love, um, we call ourselves the Pareto Partners, which is a way to help guide our work. And anybody that's not familiar with the Pareto curve, it's just the 80-20 rule. So really focus on um, and prioritize based on that 20% that's driving 80% of your business, right? So prioritize constantly, relentlessly, and again, stick to those fundamentals. That's great. Emily, there is one final question for you in particular from the audience, which is, could you describe the new drumstick that's coming out this summer? Could you give us a date and where we can purchase it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so think like, um, ice cream drumstick, you know, the, the candy coat with, you know, the ice cream, chocolate and all of that. Um, yeah, so it should be a really creamy, you know, typical coffee make, you know, creamy, rich, you know, flavor forward uh, offering. So yeah, it's actually already in Walmart and um, around, you know, kind of May, 
um, probably middle or so of May, you should start to see it at most of your uh, grocery uh, retailers. So. Awesome. Yeah. Breath of in May, so I'm very excited for to see <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Get it while you can, too. It's not going to be around forever. Absolutely. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. We could have spoken for like another three to four hours. So thank you so much, Pearl and Emily. It was a real pleasure chatting with you this afternoon. Yeah. I'm going to pass back to Jackie from CMA to wrap us up for the day. Thank you so much. This was such a fun conversation. I love that we ended on that question. That was a real audience question, everybody. Um, and I was actually wondering about it too. I was like, is this coffee ice cream in a drunk? Like, so thank you for clarifying. Um, but thank you also for just your, your thoughts and the current state of the consumer in the wake of inflation, product shortages, in particular, how you're looking at the future. I mean, I know everyone doesn't have a crystal ball, but hearing from just experts on like how you guys are thinking about it and planning for it and scenario planning really is helpful because that's all the best that any of us can do right now. So um, appreciate those thoughts for sure. Uh, as a reminder, um, the uh, recording of this webinar is going to be available to CMA and SEMA members. Um, so we will be posting that early next week and you will all get an email letting you know how to access it. It. So um, thanks again, everybody, for joining today, especially on a Friday, um, and for your insights, Emily, uh, Pearl, and for Katie running for uh, such a great panel. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you.